Hi, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, the next talk will be quite hardcore. It will be by Alex, uh, our memory tagging extension, writing memory on CRT with hardware. Awesome. So give a warm welcome to Alex. Go. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Evan, for the uh, um, introduction. Um, let me just see. So today my talk is on the R memory tagging extension, of course. Um, so my name's Alex. Um, I've been a developer for about uh, two years, I think now, um, working mostly on carrier fuse. Um, but this uh, talk is quite different. Um, it's something I've been working on recently um, and studying, and I thought it might be interesting for the rest of you as well uh, in the KD community. Um, just one quick thing: I don't think I have control of the stuff in the in the presentation. So I don't think I can change the slides at the moment. Let me, let me check, sorry. Perfect, uh, okay, we're back in. Okay, so on to the next slide. So before we go into the R memory tagging extension full on, I want to go into the motivation behind this or why would we need this new hardware feature. So the reason why we need it is because we use C and C++ in um, and when you use C and C++, you're going to, it is a memory unsafe language. Um, and it has positives, but it also has negatives. So first of all, what does it mean for a language to be memory unsafe? Well, first and foremost, um, you have access to pointers and you're able to manipulate them as you wish. You're able to do arbitrary pointer arithmetic, um, not just indexing to an array, but a lot more, pretty much anything goes as long as you do it correctly. And this provides some advantages. So, you know, you manage memory by yourself. Um, you decide when it's, when you allocate from the heap, when you deallocate from the heap. And this can be quite useful if you don't want to use like a, a language that has automatic memory management. So Java has a garbage collector that you can use, uh, Python similarly. Um, and in many cases, you do want fine grain control. So for example, if you're writing a game, you might know beforehand how much memory you need. And uh, dynamically allocating memory um, can sometimes, uh, especially in games, can be performance insensitive. So if you know how much memory you need, you can just allocate it in one chunk, ready to go. Once the round is over, for example, um, you beat the boss, you can deallocate all the memory and go to the next one. Um, but you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So what do I mean by this? Well, managing memory yourself is, is hard. Um, you have to think about the lifetime of your memory, um, who owns this memory, when should it be freed, who's responsible for freeing it. Um, you know, and, and the text needs to solve it. And you know, a lot of the time we do it correctly, but a lot of the time we don't. And, and this is where the real stinger comes in. So you know, if you do it incorrectly, um, you invoke you know undefined behavior. Once you do something. Um, incorrectly related to memory, um, you know, for example, double free, or I'll, I'll go into it in more detail, you've invoked undefined behavior. So, but what does that mean? Well, let's define under behavior first, undefined behavior first. So I'll read out the definition straight from the standard. Undefined behavior is behavior upon use of a non-portable or erroneous program construct or of erroneous data for which this international standard imposes no requirements. What does this mean? A person implementing this the language has no requirement. They don't have to do anything in response to this behavior. So they could ignore it. Um, they could, you know, print something out if they wanted to. No one could complain really. Um, they just point to the standard and be like, "Okay, that's not my problem anymore." Um, and so. You know, what a user, for example, who you know might commonly see a segmentation fault, and might experience some logical bug. Um, it just might be crazy. Who knows? Um, so, so why have we allowed you know undefined behavior to be a thing? Why don't we define the behavior? Why don't we do something like in Java, where if there's an off by one error, we just raise a array index out of bounds exception, for example? Well, these checks aren't free. Um, they have a runtime cost, which you might not want to pay in certain scenarios. The compiler writer also uh, would like an easier time. I mean, C++ is hard enough to implement by it as it is. 
and you know thinking about runtime checks um, you know can be annoying um, also assuming a program doesn't have undefined behavior allows you to do some some optimizations which again if a program does have undefined behavior um, can result in some weirdly generated code so okay well okay you know you might get some memory safety bugs um, are they common is it even a problem can we just shrug it off well they cause countless bugs um, you know just from simple crashes um, to security bugs so you know all the way back into actually that's how I was wrong it wasn't 98 it was 1988 so this was more than 30 years ago the Morris worm um, I think it took up advantage of a simple buffer overflow and took down large chunks of the internet at the time which was quite small but still managed to cause um, an estimated 10 million dollars in damage and Morris the one who created the um, the worm uh, was put in prison. So damage can seriously be done. And more recently, we can see, for example, Heartbleed, which in 2014 was an open SSL bug, I believe also a simple buff overflow, very simple to catch. Um, it affected you know, pretty much half the internet, um, half HTTPS sites, which basically rendered them useless because you, know, you could read out private keys um, and then so and HTTPS wasn't really a thing until you patched it. Um, and Chromium have done, you know, their research and, you know, they've looked at uh, their bugs, their serious security bugs, high severity, and 70% of them can be attributed to memory safety problems. So the bigger security bugs fundamentally come because of memory safety. Now, again, okay, well, another thing is, is that C and C++ programs are very common. Um, you know, so we can see all these stats here, you know, Apache and Nginx have you know, quite a large share of the web server market. Google Chrome is 64% of the web browser market. Windows, a large chunk of the desktop market. Android, similarly. And, you know, some of you I noticed being like, well, okay, Google Chrome is 64%, but I mean, Firefox, Opera, Vivaldi, they're also all pretty much written in C and C++. Why are we singling this out? So you're correct to note that pretty much all critical, you know, infrastructure that we use today uh, from kernels to uh, browsers and stuff like this are written C and C++. But what makes it really bad is that a lot of the software has pretty much monopoly status. So if you're looking at a nation state attacker or just somebody who's, who wants to make money um, from hacking, um, finding a vulnerability in Google Chrome, if you can easily exploit it and you can reach 64% of the web browsers or of web users, um, the math checks out, you want to exploit it, you want to look for these bugs. You don't want to just come across them, you want to hunt for them. So this kind of monopoly status also has a big effect. Well, okay, well, I mean, you know, I've talked about Google Chrome, uh, Apache, Nginx. Why should KDE care? Well, I mean, we, a lot of our software is written, you know, um, on top of the Linux kernel in user space. Um, there's also a lot of user space uh, software that we use, you know, so maybe Wayland is also written in C, stuff like this. Um, and obviously, we write most of our software in C, well, in C++ and sometimes in C here and there. And, you know, and our biggest libraries that we use, you know, Qt, again, C++. So, you know, we're also part of this problem, well, experiencing this problem. And, you know, we developers, you are bound to deal with crash reports. And a lot of these are probably triage as very high importance. I'll go through Nate's blog, you know, quite a few crashes. So guys, we're not perfect. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. And, you know, crashes, you know, security bugs, um, weird behavior caused by memory safety bugs, um, turns our users away. And we want people to use our software. So before I go further, I want to just uh, kind of refresh ourselves a bit. So this is the virtual address space layout for a single process. Um, so you can see the, the bottom of the address space is at the bottom of the slide. And at the top of the address space, um, we have the stack, for example. And the stack starts at the top of the address space and grows downwards, on Linux at least. And at the bottom, you can see the text segment, which is just um, the instructions of the program you're running. Um, the data is you know, some initialized data at, at the beginning of the startup. And the heap is dynamically um, allocated memory that you can get from, you know, malloc or new, or you know, make unique, make shared, etc. And the heap similarly grows upwards, starting from lower addresses. Um, and to note that the shared libraries 
um, are stuff like, you know, well, for example, Qt. Qt is um, maybe dynamically linked, and so the process will start up and put the, the shared libraries in the correct space so that you can call into it, and it's all good. And knowing that is useful for later, so keep that in mind. Um, the stack is managed by, well, at runtime with, you know, instructions. Um, the way the stack is used is managed by the compiler in the code generation, so during compile time. Um, and the way the heap looks is managed by the um, memory allocator code, so usually glibc, uh, at least on Linux. Okay, so let's look at our first kind of um, type of memory safety bug that you can run into. So we have a simple function here that's vulnerable to a stack overflow. Why? Well, this function takes in two arguments that it doesn't use, but you'll see in the next slide why I wanted to put them there. And we allocate a buffer of 100 bytes. And then we take a user input and put it into this buffer. Now, scanf does not, does not do any bounds checking of the input. It just assumes that you know, you're not going to use it any more than 100 bytes. And that is not an OK assumption, especially if somebody malicious uh, has an opportunity to put some stuff there. So if it is overrun, either on purpose or by accident, um, you have a stack overflow. So what's the problem here? Well, not only can it crash a program, um, it can also be used um, as an exploit. So let's get ourselves into the minds of an attacker. So the attacker will want to insert input, sometimes called shell code, that will allow the attacker to take control of the program, to take control of the execution flow. So what does this mean? Well, let's take a look at the um, at an example stack frame. So we have the local variable buff at the bottom here, um, near the bottom of the stack. Um, when you fill your data in 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 the buffer, it will kind of climb upwards. So if you if you fill up the buffer, if you go if you start to overflow the buffer, you're going to overwrite you know um, kind of the bookkeeping needed um, to actually run your program correctly to set up the stack frames correctly. So in this case, you know, you need a, you might need a say frame pointer if a frame pointer is generated. You'll need a return address to know what function to go back to once you're done in this function. And you also might have um, some inputs on the stack. Sometimes not, sometimes there is. Um, in th this case, I assume it is. So what an attacker will want to do is they'll want to put in code so the shell code is stuff that they want to execute. And they want to overwrite the return address such that it points back into the shell code. So it points into code that they themselves have inputted. And so the shell code might, for example, if we're exploiting Apache, we might want to open a root shell uh, because Apache commonly runs as root. Um, and we want it to be accessible over the internet. Great. Um, I mean, you have a root shell of a server, uh, game over. Okay, so you might have noticed something. Well, how do I know exactly where the return address is? Well, sometimes it's isn't obvious. If you have access to the source code, maybe you could figure it out. You can compile the program, play with it locally. Sometimes you know, might not be so lucky. Um, so the first question is, do I need to guess exactly where the return address is when I'm designing my shell code? No. Uh, just write it many times as a suffix, if you can, and then one on normal hit. OK, well, what should my return address be? Well, it should point into the shell code somewhere. But if we're off by a bit, we might just crash the program. We won't execute the shell code we want. Well, we're in luck. Um, we can use certain knock instructions. So no operation doesn't do anything. And we can prefix our shell code with it. And then hopefully our return address um, will pop back in. And it'll hit, if it hits any of the knock instructions, it's just going to call not, 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 not until it starts onto our real shell code. And then hopefully we're good. Now, obviously, you hope that the buffer is large enough for you to kind of pull this off. So if you've overflowed a four byte buffer, I mean, good luck getting any decent amount of shell code. Um, but if it's bigger, like 100 bytes, you could probably pull something off. So, and these are quite common because you have access to change the return address. So this has been around for, you know, well, since the inception of C, since the inception of C++, have we just been sitting there? No. 
So the first mitigation for this type of um, potential exploit is write or execute pages. So um, usually um, trying to allocate pages and at the time there was no requirement if you know if you could do write execute or read pages but the question is why is the stack executable it shouldn't really be executable we shouldn't want to execute code that the user has put in that doesn't really make too much sense so why don't we establish a requirement and say you can have a page and you can either write to it or you can execute it, but not both. And so how would this stop our previous attack? Well, if the return address leads back into code that we just inputted, we make sure that it's only given write access. So we can only write to this page. And so when we try to execute instructions in that page, we'll generate a fault because we're not allowed to execute that shell code. OK, so I mean, are we done here? No. We can work around it. So if you if you remember earlier, um, there are some shared libraries that um, that have code. You know, like the C standard library, C plus plus standard library, maybe Qt, whatever. And so the workaround is well, why don't we just set the return address to a commonly known um, function that we might want to use in the C in the C library? So for example, we might call system bin slash sh. So we'll set up we'll set up the return address check correctly. We'll set up correctly. Um, we'll put in the argument to the string that we want, or the arguments that we want, and then we'll call it. And then we've we've got ourselves a root shell again. So while this work, well, libc will be um, mapped in with execute permissions. So we've just worked around it. Okay, have we just been sitting again? No. So. Another concept is, or another tool, is address-based layout randomization, ASLR. The idea is randomize the address space, um, which means that it's hard to guess you know, um, what the location of this libc function is. Because without ASLR, I can just be on my local laptop, have a look what libc is on my local laptop, and I'll probably map to what I was going on on the server, for example. Um, but with ASLR, it'll be random each time. So again, for 32-bit, it doesn't really work out as on-off entropy. Um, you can get around it. There's a paper on it. And it still isn't perfect on 64-bit, but it's still kind of useful to still have, so distributions will still use it. Um, if you're interested to see how to break it on 64-bit, Hacking Blind paper um, will show you. Although it is kind of complicated. It's a talk in itself. So what you're seeing here is kind of like a cat and mouse game, but we haven't really stopped the problem at its core yet. And maybe we never will. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So okay. Well, that's on the stack, but we can also have heap overflows. So we're going to have two structs here. Um, one just stores a character or an array, and the other has a function pointer. Now we're going to all allocate these two on the heap, and maybe they might be basically adjacent to each other. And we're going to assign the function pointer, you know, just to the exit function. But at the same time, we're going to accept a user argument, and we're going to write it into the name array. Now, what could happen here is that if I overwrite it, I might be lucky enough and find that I, because D and F are adjacent to each other, or adjacent to each other, we hope, I can actually overwrite it such that the function pointer is not exit, but a function of my choice. Again, if I set up the arguments correctly, I could do something similar to you know a return to libc attack, or even to my own shell code. Similarly, again, um, but the same workarounds apply. Oh, sorry, the same mitigations apply. But as we can see, the heap is still exploitable, despite the fact that the heap doesn't really contain a return address per se. Um, there's only kind of like internal bookkeeping. We've still managed that in this case, we've still managed to find a return address and, and change the control flow of the program. Again, if 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 write or execute exists, then this doesn't work out straight away. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that you can do on the heap what you can do on the stack, although it is a bit harder. 
Okay, so that's us. So those two, the heap and stack overflows are kind of what we call spatial memory safety bugs. Um, so those are like when we manage memory incorrectly and start, other starts, uh, stuff starts overwriting each other over time. What about um, temporal memory safety bugs? So this is when we incorrectly manage the lifetime um, of memory that we allocate. So here's the use of the free function. So we declare a, a pointer to an integer. Um, we allocate some memory to it, we assign it value, we free it, and then assign a value to it again. Now, this example by itself isn't you know, exploitable, um, but the vulnerability is that we've used something after we freed it, so we have no claim to this memory, and so this could easily be a crash. Although, again, it's undefined behavior, so it might not crash at all. Okay, so let's imagine a scenario where we could exploit a use after free. So, you know, as in, as in the previous case, we freed the memory, but we still had a dangling pointer to it. So let's assume that the program um, assumes the data contains a function pointer. Um, so the dangling pointer points to a function pointer. And let's say the attacker is able to input a return address of his choice into a new allocation. So maybe uh, there's a malloc call or a new call later, and the attacker can put in some input. But if the program uses that dangling pointer and the attacker successfully puts a return address of its choice there, again, you've taken over the control flow. So again, um, a lot of assumptions here. Uh, is this likely? Well, I mean, yeah. Um, so half of the 70% of high severity uh, bugs can be attributed to use after free. So quite a lot. So it's definitely something we should look out for. Um, I mean, to, to avoid dangling pointers when programming, please, once you've freed something, set the pointer to null. Um, that will help to prevent uh, this particular scenario here. Again, we can do similar stuff on the stack. Um, so we have a use after return here. So if you see um, the func function here returns a pointer to an integer, so we allocate one on the stack and return a pointer to it. But obviously, after it's returned, um, we have no claim to this memory. Um, it's a use after return. And we try to use it in the main function. Again, undefined behavior. We have no claim to that memory anymore. Um, you also have use after scope. So if you're in a scope, the same applies, similar to return. So an attacker exploits this in the same way as the use after free that we talked about earlier. Now, let's look at some other tools that. Um, that have been used to help prevent these type of things happening in the first place. So we looked at mitigations already. Um, but let's talk about how can we even prevent these coming into our programs. So we don't even we could be in a scenario where we don't even need these mitigations. So again, so you know, prevention is better than the cure. Um, so in this section, I'm gonna go through some tools and we'll build up to you know MTE. Do some mentor activity. Okay, the time's good. Okay, right. So let's talk about address sanitizer first. So basically, address sanitizer is some compiled instrumentation, so and a runtime library, and it detects quite a few of the uh, classes of bugs that we've talked about earlier. Um, it's easy to use. You can use it now in your programs. Please do when you're developing. Um, luckily, if you use uh, extra CMake modules and um, the KDE frameworks, um, as you can see with that line of snippet, you'll get the right um, compile compiler and linker flags set up for you. So it's more of a debugging tool, more than a, than a mitigation. Um, but the idea is that it kind of, upon detecting these types of bugs, it will quit the program and give you good debugging information such that you can uh, fix the issue. So how does it work? What does it use? So to detect spatial memory bugs, it uses a concept called the red zone. So each allocation, both on the stack and on the heap, and even in globals, has a red zone on either side. And basically, it means that if you overflow, for example, by one, you'll find yourself in the red zone. Um, finding yourself in the red zone means um, abort the program, you've done something wrong. So as you can see, there's an overhead there because the red zone stuff is just empty kind of space, basically, uh, designed to catch your mistakes. 
and to detect temporal memory bugs, so you know, um, freeing them and using a dangling pointer, we use something called the quarantine around allocations. So basically, it consists of a queue such that when you free, um, the allocator tries its best not to reallocate that memory very soon. And it keeps track of the fact that, um, that it was freed recently, such that if you do use the dangling pointer again, you will crash. So how is this done? Well, there's something called shadow memory, which you can see a table of here. Um, so it's quite clever. In the compiled instrumentation, on every load and store, um, it does a quick check to see what type of memory is it. So as you can see, memory points to, with a simple offset, you can point to the shadow memory. Um, it's, it's very simple math, basically. Well, I think one or two instructions um, so to keep the overhead low. And the shadow memory stores metadata in one byte, um, talking about eight bytes of addressable memory. And then it says, well, how much of this memory is addressable? And, f and for the parts that are unaddressable, what type are they? You know, is it a red zone, is it a quarantine, et cetera? And so using this, it can, det it can determine if you've gone into the red zone, if you've gone into something that's in quarantine. So it's quite nifty, quite smart. So it was released probably about 10 years, well, it was released 10 years ago. And it reduced overheads quite considerably compared to Valgrind. So if you ever use Valgrind, the overhead was quite excessive. Um, people still use Val Valgrind now. Um, it, it does detect some things that Aston doesn't. But Aston had much better CPU overhead, 73%, so 10%, 10 uh, less. Sorry, not 10%, 10 times less, order of magnitude. And the memory usage increased by three times, so quite a lot, um, but still probably more manageable than Valgrind. And so you could use this easily for debugging for most programs, but production use, probably not. And, you know, Chrome and Mozilla, and I guess us, have had a good time, you know, finding bugs with this. So when they used it, they found 300 bugs in a Chrome and Cobase in the first 10 months. But it is a dynamic analysis tool. So a static analysis tool just looks at the source code and decides if there's you know any problems that it can it knows about, but the dynamic analysis tool only does its work when it's running, and so you know your analysis is only good as the test suite you're using, no tests, um, as is effectively useless. But recently we've seen the trend of fuzzing. Um, KDE does use fuzzing. I think we, uh, somebody's manager, I think it's Albert, who manages OSSS, the OSSS fuzz, which uses Asan. So fuzzing is basically just using random inputs. And if it crashes, it's like, okay, I'll try more inputs that are like this. Um, that's a whole field in itself. Um, but Asin and fuzzing are an amazing tool. Okay, so what's the next iteration? What are we going for next? So now we have hardware address sanitizer. So that consists of compiler instrumentation and a runtime library, similar to Asin. And it detects a similar class of bugs to Asin, but it uses a completely different technique uh, of doing its work. So firstly, it relies on a feature called ARM TBI um, to store something called tags. Um, and the, the technique it's used, it uses is called memory tagging. So I'll talk about that more, more in a moment. Again, pretty much as easy to use as ASAN, um, just provide the correct compiler flags. Uh, we don't support an extra CMake modules yet, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's only supported in Clang, I think, as well. Um, and only supported an ARM for now. Intel is releasing something called uh, linear address masking, which might mean the Hwasan might actually work on Intel soon. So keep your eyes peeled. Okay, so I mentioned ARM TBI, but what, what is it? So registers, at least on AARC64, are 64 bits wide, but virtual addresses are only 48 bits. Um, so there's only 48 bits of addressable memory, or uh, well, two to the 48 bits. Um, and so the other 16 bits are just set to zero or all ones. Um, and it has to be that, otherwise, you know, bad, bad times for you. But ARM TBI is a new feature, um, well, not new, but a hardware feature that relaxes this requirement. And so in that top pop, top byte, you can store any value that you want. So um, just the eight just the eight bytes, not the, sorry, just the byte. Um, the other byte under it, um, still has to have a certain value. But this top byte, you can put any value you want. And so in this case, Hwasan will use it to store a tag associated with a pointer. 
Now, some of you may have thought, but you know, is this a good idea? Like, is it always the case that we're gonna, not going to use all 64 bits? I mean, you know, Intel is going to introduce or might have already introduced five level paging, which means that it actually they've opened the fact that we might have a two to the 57 bit address space. So could it be 64 soon? Could this not work out? No, I'll leave it to you to think about that. So let's talk about the concept of memory tagging. Uh, it's a general concept. It's not related to ARMMT by itself. Um, you can just think of it independently of the hardware. So let's first define two key words before we can uh, carry on. So first we have the tagging granularity, the amount of memory associated with any given tag, so 16 bytes um, for Hwasan. And then we have the tagging size. So it's the possible size of a given tag. How many tag values are there? So if it's one byte, you can have 256 different tag values. And so each granule of memory is associated with a tag, and then all pointers to that same location memory should have the same tag. And so upon each memory access, you want to make sure that you, you compare the tag of the pointer with the tag of the memory it points to. And if they don't match, um, you abort, you say there's an issue. Okay, so that's quite general. Um, why for memory safety? Well, it uses compiler instrumentation and the runtime library, and it uses this concept to basically do its magic. So what does it do? So the memory allocator is modified to do the heap tagging. So on allocation, you have to align to the tagging granularity. And you randomly assign a tag to the memory and the pointer, and they should be the same. On deallocation, um, so on free, for example, you assign a new random tag to memory. Um, so why does this work? Well, it works because let's say you allocate a value x, and then you so if you're preventing use after free, if you deallocate and get a new value, chances are it's not going to be x; it's going to be some other value y. So if you use that pointer again, if you use that dangling pointer again, there's going to be a tag mismatch. Um, similarly, for a, for a series of allocations, they're likely, um, because they're independent, to have different tags. And so if you overflow into a different allocation, they're likely to have different tags. Um, you still have a 1 over 2, 5, 6 probability of missing um, some. Um, so sometimes they might match when they shouldn't. But I mean, this is more than 99%, so this is pretty good. Um, the compiler also needs to be changed. Um, so all, all local variables need to be aligned to the tagging granularity. And again, you assign a tag to the memory and pointer. Um, so instead of deallocation, you change the tag again on function exit. Um, so when you get rid of the stack frame. Um, for the stack, a single base tag is used, and all other tags are derived from it. So basically, it's a bit too expensive to do a separate um, allocation, sorry, to generate a random tag for each allocation on the stack. So you just use a paste tag, and then you might increment on top of it and just go in circles, for example. So add one to the next allocation, add two to the next allocation, and stuff like that. OK, so is it better than Asa? Well, it has a smaller RAM overhead, because you don't need a red zone. You don't need quarantine. You just need the storage for the tags itself, and you need to align uh, both the stack and heap variables. Um, it's also better at dictating non-adjacent out bounds access. So the Renzo doesn't really help you if the access is not adjacent, if it's like all over the place. Um, it's also big to at detecting use after free over time, again, because the quarantine is only good as the size of the queue. Um, but ASAN still does have some kind of advantages. So the bug detection is deterministic for ASAN, but Hwasan still has a chance to miss it, even though it had, you know, um, there's one over 256 probability of missing it. Also, because of the granule, if you, if you for example, have an 8 byte allocation and you overflow 12 bytes, it's going to look like it's the same tag, or they will have the same tag, and so you won't catch that. OK, so let's motivate ARM MTE. So ARM MTE is a new hardware feature. Um, it's not available yet, but it's available on Chem if you want to play around with it. Um, so it's an implementation of the memory tagging concept um, with the same tagging, tagging granularity of 16 bytes, but the tagging size is 4 bits, so it's less than Hwasan. Um, again, it uses ARM TBI to stick it in uh, to give space for a tag and a pointer. The mapping of granules to tag values 
is stored in main memory, so it's reserved at boot. So this is memory that you can't use it for any other purpose after it's booted. So that's roughly 3% of your memory gone. Um, so keep that in mind, that's a cost, that's an overhead. Um, there's also some instructions to generate manipulate and view tags. Um, and there's two modes of usage. Um, so assuming you've mapped the memory um, with MT enabled, so there's a flag for that. Um, you don't have to think about it as application user. Um, but there's two types, the synchronous, so the tag is checked on each load and store instruction um, straight away, and the segmentation fault is generated with a faulting address. Um, this is slower, but again, you get more useful information for debugging. But asynchronous tag checking is delayed until the next context switch. Um, so a segmentation fault generated is generated without a faulting address. So it's quicker, so it might be good as a mitigation for these types of bugs, but it's not good for debugging. Okay, so you can have, um, so again, heap tagging, there's an implementation for, for glibc. Um, a certain tag is reserved for internal data structures like bookkeeping and headers and stuff like that. But fortunately, the tagging granularity is the same. So the current, so heap tagging doesn't have much of an alignment issue. Um, again, a similar allocate, uh, algorithm to Hwasan. But to note here, the difference is, is that um, calloc is actually no more expensive than malloc because there's a special instruction to um, set the value to zero. Um, so it doesn't cost anything extra. And realloc always retags, no matter if you have to move the memory or if it doesn't move, you always just retag. Um, so that's useful. Um, stack tagging is done with uh, Clang, so there's an, oh, sorry, there's an implementation for that. Uh, sorry uh, for interrupting you, Alex. Uh, you have three minutes left. OK, OK. So again, similarly to Hassan, there's some stack tagging. Um, it's, it's implemented as a simple function pass. Um, but the, but the, the, um, the alignment is much of a bigger problem there. So you need to do a 60 mine alignment, and that can be quite annoying. And, but stack safety analysis can be used to basically, it's basically a tool that decides if there's a chance of memory safety issues occurring. If there's no chance of this occurring in a function or a scope, just don't bother tagging it, and you'll be fine. So that can help uh, reduce the code size overhead and just the runtime overhead. Um, so here's an example. I think we're going to have to skip over this just to the time issues. Um, but you can see there's some extra instructions there. Um, but what ARM MT offers is it offers it should offer smaller CPU overhead because you don't need to you don't need to do compile instrumentation for each access that's handled in the hardware for you. Um, obviously the hardware isn't released yet, so we don't know what that is. Um, but hopefully it's quite low. The RAM overhead is also um, kind of a tiny bit smaller. Um, well, you, you can't really see it in user space, but there is storage. So if it's 3% already gone, and then there's like the alignment um, that you need to deal with as well. Um, the code size also should be smaller because you don't need the compiler instrument, or a lot of the compiler instrumentation. Um, and from my measurements, it's less than 5% as claimed. And for heap tagging, a good thing is that you don't need to recompile programs. Um, so long as you've got glibc, you're in good shape. Um, Hwasa is still better because the tagging size is bigger. So with with only four bits, then we still have a 7% chance of missing out on the bug. So that can be a big issue. Um, so there are some unconventional use cases. Um, there's only one minute left, so I can't really talk much about it. But I think the slides are clear just from reading it. So I'm going to leave it to half a minute of questions, I think, unfortunately. I wanted to go for these slides, but um, I think I can. Are there any questions? Okay, first, uh, thank you for the awesome talk. Uh, I would really, 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 really advise you to split it into three talks for the next academy. <laughs> so, okay, because this is something that we should all learn and I guess know by heart. Uh, a question that I would like to ask, uh, so most of these tools are something that mitigates already made bugs or detects the already made bugs. Do you see a world where we could avoid making those bugs in the first place? Um, obviously. I think the world is always trade-offs, right? So in many cases, we can avoid quite a lot of them by using just a different language. The real question is, can we do it? Can we have it like a free lunch? Um, so I guess we've seen in Rust as some improvement in certain areas. Um, but again, not a free lunch is a, in some ways a harder language. Mm -hmm. So 
I don't think we'll kind of reach that kind of 100% stage. Um, but hopefully the trade-offs will fall more in our favor over time. So I think ArmMT is one of those, for example. Cool. Uh, I think that's, that's the, all the time that we have. Thank you yet again. And enjoy all the claps in the chat. Uh, people are clapping, clapping, clapping. I, I'm not going to, to count all the claps that you got. Okay, thank you. So thank you yet again. Yep. Um, yeah, but if any questions, feel free to email me or just I'll be, I'm commonly in, um, my nickname is Feverfew, so any other questions, please let me know. Yeah, thank you. Cheers.